Hi, my name is Sam Benavides. I'm a third year medical student with the Medical College of Georgia, and I'll be presenting a case report of renal cell carcinoma in a patient with aldosterone producing adenoma or APA. So primary aldosteronism or Kahn syndrome is an underdiagnosed cause of hypertension estimated to be prevalent in over five to 10% of hypertensive patients. The presentation is variable with the kind of classic triad being hypertension, hypokalemia, and metabolic alkalosis. However, more recent studies have suggested that the hypokalemia is really present in less than half of these patients. And then in addition to the morbidity and mortality associated with electrolyte derangements and hypertension, um, patients with PA have also been shown to have a higher cardiovascular risk compared to age, sex, and blood pressure match patients with essential hypertension. One study found that they were four times more likely to have strokes and six and a half times more likely to have non-fatal MIs. So we're going to start with some brief background on our patient. He first presented in September 2016, at which point he was a male in his 40s on three antihypertensives, including a diuretic. He had a history of low potassium and magnesium that was attributed to the diuretic use, but was requiring persistent electrolyte supplementation. Over the course of the next year, his diuretic uh, was discontinued, but he was demonstrated to be persistently hypokalemic at 3.3. Which brings us to November when he was found to have a potassium of 3.0 on his pre-visit labs. So at this point, screening for hyperaldosteronism was performed and his aldosterone renin ratio came back elevated at 45. So he was referred to endocrinology and he first saw them in January, 2018. For further background on the patient, he also had a history of type two diabetes, hyperlipidemia, sleep apnea, and kidney stones. Medication list, he was on the antihypertensives, potassium supplementation, metformin, and insulin. Surgical history was really non-contributory. Family history, there was no adrenal or GU disease. And social history, he had quit chewing tobacco about 20 years prior, but there was no significant alcohol or drug use. Uh, he reported that his systolic blood pressures were normally running in the 130s at home, with sort of rare increases up to the 180s. He also reported occasional spells of headaches, dizziness, and shortness of breath, as well as some subjective weight loss, um, which isn't really supported by the chart. ROS was otherwise negative. Um, physical exam, he was hypertensive in the 130s over 90s, and BMI was 34, but physical exam was otherwise normal. Um, pertinent negatives in terms of the labs, his CBC was unremarkable, kidney function was good, and then the endocrine clinic checked a PTH and ionized calcium given the history of kidney stones, which came back relatively normal. However, his aldosterone renin ratio was found to be even more elevated at 70 on this visit. Generally, these patients require confirmatory testing um, in cases of ele uh, elevated ARRs. However, in cases like this one with low potassium, low renin, and aldosterone over 20, it's been suggested that you can proceed straight to adrenal CT. So that's what's done for this patient. And then on CT, we find this left adrenal nodule measuring of seven millimeters. Um, adrenal washout is calculated based on the attenuation on non-contrast, portal venous, and 15-minute delay phases. Uh, anything over 60% is considered uh, consistent with adrenal adenoma. The big mimics we see are hypercellular tumors like hepatocellular and renal cell carcinoma. Um, so if the attenuation on any of these individual phases, particularly portal venous, is over 120, that's an indication to consider alternative diagnoses. Um, but this is fairly consistent with adrenal adenoma. However, at the time of the CT, they also find this contrast enhancing right renal mass. Measures 1.7 centimeters on the medial right lower pole. As you can see, it's got washout characteristics similar to the adrenal nodule, but the uh, attenuation on portal venous phase is over 120. So this is concerning for renal cell carcinoma. At this point, he's referred to urology for evaluation of the renal mass. Nephrometry score is calculated as 7P, um, so he's determined to be a candidate for partial nephrectomy. It's decided that he'll follow up after adrenal vein sampling, which is important to help distinguish between unilateral versus bilateral disease as well as which side the disease is on. So even though this patient had the left adrenal nodule, he could have a non-functioning left-sided nodule with right-sided hyperplasia or something along those lines. However, on AVS, his adrenal vein aldosterone ratio comes back as 13 for the left versus the right adrenal vein. Anything over four is highly sensitive and specific for a unilateral excess. So at this point, we're fairly confident that he probably has a functioning adrenal nodule. 
in conjunction with endocrine and urology, it's decided um, the patient elects to undergo robotic assisted laparoscopic right partial nephrectomy and left adrenalectomy, which is scheduled for April. Pre-op, he gets ANSEF and a stress dose of hydrocortisone. Uh, he does well during surgery with no uh, apparent complications and good hemostasis. The adrenalectomy is performed first and the, then the patient is flipped for the partial nephrectomy. On pathology, the adrenal nodule comes back as a cortical adenoma. You can see the high lipid content on the high power view, and then the kind of smooth borders of the adenoma on the lower power view. The renal mass comes back as a clear cell renal cell carcinoma. It's PT1A disease, given that it's smaller than four centimeters and confined to the kidney. You can see the characteristics, uh, characteristic clear cells on the higher power view caused by the high glycogen and lipid content. And then this image on the right is PAX8 staining, highlighting the scattered tumor cells. For his hospital course, post-op day one, his morning cortisol is low, so he undergoes high-dose cosyntropin testing, which shows an inadequate response. So the testing is repeated on post-op day two, at which point the response is still inadequate, so he has started on prednisone for potential adrenal insufficiency. Aldosterone is less than four on post-op day one and three, um, which is consistent for, with biochemical cure for the APA. Pre-op, he had been on four antihypertensives. Um, they had actually added the hydrolyzine because his blood pressures were still getting into the 160s. But he does well during his hospitalization. Blood pressure improves. Um, sodium downtrends as potassium uptrends. And kidney function remains stable. So he does well, and he's able to be discharged on just two of his blood pressure medications and half of his dose of supplemental potassium. He follows up in May with urology. Um, from their perspective, he's healing well, and the staples are removed. Um, from an endocrine perspective, the cosyntropin testing is repeated and still shows an inadequate response. So at this point, he is formally diagnosed with adrenal insufficiency and started on hydrocortisone. The differential diagnosis at this point included right adrenal atrophy related to the kind of chronic left-sided overproduction um, versus possible iatrogenic damage to the right adrenal gland during the partial nephrectomy. In October, the potassium disc is discontinued because his potassium has been maintaining over four during this period. And then November, he follows up with urology, at which point a six-month post-op CT is uh, negative for any signs of local recurrence or metastasis. However, at this point, the patient has a bit, um, there's a bit of an incident in clinic and the patient has to be discharged from the practice. He was given information for follow-up. However, there's nothing else really in the chart until September, 2020, at which point he was referred to MCG Schemont Clinic. Thankfully, his two and a half year post-op CT remained negative at that time. Um, in February, he underwent bariatric surgery and did so well afterwards that he was able to be discharged on just half of his dose of carbidolol. Um, March, three-year post-op CT is, remains negative, so he's just got two more years to go of the kind of standard five-year surveillance, and potassium is holding steady at 4.6. So to kind of round out his story, he's seen back in internal medicine clinic in April, at which point his office and home blood pressures have been maintaining in the 110s to 120s over 70s over 80s. Um, or 70s to 80s, excuse me. So, and this is just on half the carbidolol 12 and a half milligrams by daily versus four antihypertensives prior to surgery. So he's done well. So how common is it to get adrenal adenoma and renal cell carcinoma in the same patient? Research in this area is pretty limited given a lot of the studies have pretty small sample sizes as well as a lot of them combining functional versus non-functional um, adenomas and then adenomas and hyperplasia. There was one study that found that renal cell carcinoma accounted for 13% of malignancies that were diagnosed in patients with PA, as well as an autopsy series, which found that 14% of patients who died with renal cell carcinoma also had adrenal adenomas or hyperplasia on, bio, or on autopsy, excuse me. Um, in terms of case reports, I found four cases of patients with renal cell carcinoma and functional adenomas. Um, two of those were aldosterone producing, um, one was cortisol producing, and one was mixed cortisol aldo. Um, in terms of the specifically APAs, um, neither of those cases were contralateral for the kidney cancer versus the adrenal adenoma. Um, there were also 10 cases of patients with renal cell carcinoma and non-functioning adenomas. I believe three of those were contralateral. And then uh, three cases of patients with renal cell carcinoma and adrenal hyperplasia. 
In terms of mechanisms that have been proposed for this effect, um, high aldosterone has been suggested to raise um, oxidative stress in cells, causing DNA damage to the renal tubular cells. This image on the right is from a study that looked at this effect. Um, so the y-axis is a measure of oxidative, uh, oxidative stress. This is the control group. You can see the higher oxidative stress in the aldosterone-treated group. And then they also co-treated cells with a plurinone and aldosterone, which given that these cells had a lower um, level of oxidative stress, suggested that this effect is mediated via the mineralocorticoid receptor. Other mechanisms that I uh, found were increased aldosterone levels upregulating the KROS proto-oncogene, as well as impacts of the renin angiotensin system on angiogenesis, cellular proliferation, and immun immunomodulation, uh, largely mediated through the AT1 receptor or ANG2. Um, but again, a lot more research is needed in this area to establish if this is an actual effect. Um, for comparison, renal cell carcinoma and adrenal adenomas are estimated to be prevalent in just one, like 1% to 3% of the general, general population. So 13 and 14% would be elevated. However, it's hard to say whether one of these is a risk factor for the other or if it goes both ways, especially given that a lot of the more mechanism studies were uh, specific to elevated aldosterone levels, um, whereas in the case reports, there were a lot of cases of renal cell and then non-functioning adenomas. Um, so more research is needed. Major takeaways, uh, it's important to screen for PA in patients with hypertension, specifically resistant hypertension, defined as blood pressure over 140 over 90 in patients on at least three antihypertensives as well as hypertension and hypokalemia, sleep apnea, adrenal incidentalomas, uh, first degree relatives with PA, and then maybe in the future patients with renal cell. Um, one thing that could have been done slightly differently for this patient would have been to screen a bit sooner, given that he met three of these criteria. Even though his hypokalemia was thought to be diuretic induced, that's still an indication for screening. And the reason this is so important is because in patients where the aldosterone excess is specifically unilateral, Treatment by unilateral adrenalectomy has been shown to improve clinical, biochemical, and quality of life outcomes for these patients. There was a meta-analysis in 2015, which found that 42% of patients who underwent adrenalectomy had their hypertension cured after the surgery, and up to 100% of patients had biochemical cures defined as resolution of the hypokalemia and normalization of the aldosterone and renin levels. Um, there's also a cohort study in 2017, which found that 84% of patients had clinical improvement so lower degrees of hypertension and requiring fewer antihypertensives, as well as 98% uh, of these patients had biochemical improvement defined as resolution of the hypokalemia and then improvements in the aldosterone and renin le levels. Um, so adrenalectomy can really make a difference for these patients. I'd like to thank the Department of Pathology for their help obtaining my patient pathological images. These are the case reports, and these are my sources. If you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me. I appreciate your time and hope you're doing well. Thank you.